everybody. How is everyone doing at Web Summit today? We are going to be talking about the year 2030, which is remarkable because I saw some of you partying last night, and I'm not sure you're going to make it to 2018, but we'll, we'll get there. Uh, give yourselves a round of applause for actually being here this morning. I um, we're going to start this off with some awesome content. We have three amazing experts in front of us. And what I'd like to do is get straight into that content. So first of all, to give you an overview of life in 2030, please sir, welcome Andra Kay. Andra, take it away. Thank you. So I need you to use your imaginations. I did not bring robots with me, but it's morning. The house is gently blending the real light tones and the selection of bird song to wake me up. Then my retro tease maid serves me tea, and the wall changes from sunrise to news channels and my daily calendar. I ask the house to see if my daughter's awake and moving, and to remind her that the clothes only clean themselves when they're in the cupboard, not on the floor. Affordable pickup bots really are still no good at clothing, but they're all right at toys when the kids are younger. And in the kitchen, I spend a while recalibrating the house farm because, you know, I'm a geek. I like putting the time into growing the legumes and broccoli. I mean, pretty much anybody can do leafy greens and berries, but the larger fruits and vegetables are still a little tricky. And, you know, it's only total hippies that do the vat-grown meats and meat substitutes. I'm very proud of the fact that my house is energy neutral. In fact, sometimes we produce electricity, but as a species, humans still seem to need more electricity than we produce. We still have our own car, which my daughter will use to shuttle to school. And uh, she will do it in remote-operated semi-autonomous mode. It's statistically the safest. Control will be distributed between the car, the road network, and a dedicated five-star operator. And it gives her the comfort of traveling in her own family vehicle. Whereas I travel in efficiency mode, but I'll probably set the setting to quiet because I don't really mind if I'm traveling autonomously or with a driver or with other passengers, but I think I, I prefer it to be quiet and concentrate on work and thinking. I work in a creative collective. We provide services and we build the collective around shared things like a love of historic punk rock bands and growing vegetables. Really, not like branding the business or building the network because our algorithms can adjust that much quicker than we can and put in whatever bids for contracts we need. So the collective does allow us to have better health and social plans than the usual gig economy. And some services, though, like healthcare or manufacturing, still have a lot of infrastructure. So it's harder to afford the flexibility that a creative collective offers. Uh, we can co-work, we can remote work, and our biggest business expense is data subscriptions. But this is a utopic future. If you're poor, that's not what it looks like. It's morning, I'm on basic income, so to get my morning data and calendar, I have to listen to five ads and submit five feedbacks. Everyone in our family has to do some, but I do extra so that I get parental privileges and can control some of my children's input. We can't afford to modify the house to generate electricity, so we can't afford decent house farms. I try and grow things the old-fashioned way in dirt, but we don't have automation, so if I'm busy, we lose our produce through lack of water or bugs or something like that. Now, everyone can afford Soylent, though, but if I've got extra cash, we can splurge on junk food like burgers and pizzas. My youngest goes to a community school meetup, but the older kids homeschool themselves on the public school system. It's supposed to be a personalized AI, but we still have to select which traditional value package we subscribe to. I'm already running late for work. I see I've got an assortment of jobs in my queue. I'll be driving robots around, I'll be providing customer service, and oh, I'll be getting out of the house, driving real people around for a while, or at least driving. <sighs> but I've got to finish more customer viewer feedbacks while I drive, 
and be on call for the remote support services. And I need to do all of my permissions for DNA use because I can get paid if my DNA is used in commercial trials or products. And that's how you get healthcare. You contribute your own cells to get the healthcare that you need. We also do something called bug catching, which is where we go around and kind of scrape up lichen or dog poo or whatever we can find. Because if we can find something unique for the samplers, we can get a big payback. One of my friends is making a lot of monies from residuals because something she found is being used in a psychoactive compound that's very popular. Now, I can't afford to go online shopping, so I'll have to go to the mall this weekend, which is so exhausting. There are robots and hollow ads everywhere spamming you for feedback. And at least at home, you have some privacy. But when you're out in public, everything is eye-tracking you and monitoring you and trying to guess your preferences and filling your attention with feeds. And then you have to, you know, take selfies, take foodies and emote and share. I tell you, it's exhausting. It used to be fun when I did it with friends, but now that I have kids, honestly. So I thought robots were going to make the future easier. But really, life's changed. The future is a lot more about data and feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. And now to present his vision of 2030, uh, Jacques Vandenbroek. Yeah, we start with a small movie. This is the most intricate and powerful computer in the world. It contains over a billion lines of code. To put things in perspective, an average app on your phone contains 40,000 lines of code. We only needed four times that amount to put a man on the moon. Fifteen million lines introduced us to the start of home computing. Now, using 50 million lines of code in the largest machine ever built, we're trying to simulate the start of it all, the Big Bang. But it takes 12 million more to share something with friends. A mere 14 million lines to fly around the world. Yet 100 million for a car that can park itself. Unbelievable? Let's Google it. You can find anything with their 2 billion lines of code. Still, less code than what you'll find in the most intricate and powerful computer in the world. You. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Let's start with the good news. Each and one of you is still the most intricate and powerful computer in the world. And that's the vision we're having into 2030. Uh, Technology is not going to take over all of your jobs. But what's a job? A job is a combination of tasks. And 60% of job content is going to change. And jobs are going to be more attractive. Technology is going to support you. One in six jobs will disappear. And I'll talk about one of those jobs and what you need to do about that. Let's suppose many of you, and you probably are, you're tech savvy. So you're going to nurture your tech skills, which is probably good. But what you really need to do is nurture your soft skills. Because I've talked to quite a few of you starting your new business, and you're all very enthusiastic about what your ID does. But you need to sell it. And if you're really successful, you need to manage many people. So you really need to work on that skills and on those skills. Some industries, some jobs like doctors and nurses, will change because of technology, and rightly so, because if we don't use technology in, for example, our healthcare, 50, 50% of people leaving school will need to work in healthcare, otherwise we can't provide it anymore. So that's where technology helps. Let's end with one job that will disappear, the job of a driver. Funny enough, it's one of the toughest dri the jobs to find, or people to find. There's a lot of scarcity in drivers, but in five to 10 years, those jobs will disappear. So if you're a driver today, what do you need to do? 
you need to find out what you're good at, which is probably technology. You like uh, tinkering with engines and that sort of thing. So we will take you in five to 10 years to become a maintenance engineer. If you wait for it, you will become unemployed. So that's the positive vision on the labor market. Robotics will not take over. There's gonna be a new combination, but you need to be in charge of your own skills towards the future. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. And uh, last but certainly not least, with his vision of 2030, please welcome John Vickers. Thank you very much, Kurt. Is it working? Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much indeed. I think mine will be the most prosaic of the presentations in that we're pretty much grounded in today. Um, I don't think anybody really here would know what 2030 is going to look like. I think we have an idea in a sense. We're trying to help dictate the future by keeping humanity front and center of it. There's probably somebody in this audience, somebody at school today, perhaps somebody still in nappies who's going to completely change what I say. But I still hope, and I'll end with a quote from somebody that, that reached out to the moon many years ago, so I'm very grateful to, to Jack for doing the space introduction for me, <laughs> that humanity, in order to be human, that's what I want to see in 2030, that we haven't lost out to the rise of the machine. So we're building the world's largest pool, a number of them globally. I always usually get the same reaction, a pool. But pool because two things. One, we don't understand 95% of the surface of the Earth. Most of the water on it hasn't been explored, understood. We've managed to screw it up pretty well. We managed to exploit it. It'd be wonderful to think by 2030 that we understood a great deal more and if we're gonna utilize energy from it or resources from our seas and oceans, that we're gonna do so sustainably and with much more effect in terms of how we symbiotically get back on with our planet. In addition, we're looking to help pioneer um, the robot uh, revolution that's already happened in the offshore energy industry. So you may be familiar with the ROV industry that goes around and helps the oil and gas and now the sort of increasing wind turbine market. We're also interested in helping humans in extreme environments, be they underwater or in space. And as such, we're building in Blue Abyss and associated facilities, the world's first commercial astronaut training center. In going out into space, we have to look at a number of um, um, disciplines. We have to look at a number of scenarios that affect the human body. But the best environment, believe it or not, for doing that on Earth is water. So water links our future if we're going to expand from this planet. It links our past. It links our evolutionary track. The pool, as you see, is rather large. Um, don't worry about the title slide. We often talk more so for the moment about space. This is a future looking event. Let's talk about space. We see the fact that robots, and robots still, three people have been to the bottom of the Marianas Trench, but they didn't do so on their own. They went in a vehicle. It's virtually impossible to ever imagine, no matter what genome therapy we ever do, what sort of suits we develop, that we would be able to put an actual human being 11 miles, uh, 11 kilometers down on the seabed but 12 people have managed to stand on the, another planet. We think that that will continue. We obviously are gonna be increasingly looking for water in terms of any future uh, exploration we do, so the robots will be a huge part of that. But when it comes to the actual exploration, when it comes to the actual experience, we expect that once the robots have done their bit, and we've obviously had robots and rovers on the Martian surface and the lunar surface, and probes go to other moons and planets, for a number of decades now. But at the same time, I think that it's always behoven on us as people and as a species, if we're gonna evolve and continue to be humans, to continue to drive behind that initial search. You know the old phrase, go west, my son, I think remains, whether we're gonna go into our oceans or whether we're gonna go off planet. So a combination of humans and robots, I can absolutely see. The use of virtual reality to guide us, virtual reality perhaps, and the robot to do some sort of pre-exploration just to check that we as humans could go there. But there'll always be one person, one annoying person perhaps, who says, I want to go there too. And I heard a talk yesterday where somebody talked about putting a chip, a bit like Total Recall, and we know how that wrong, went wrong, uh, into your brain. So that if you wanted to become a, a cowboy, this was their example, not mine, but if you wanted to become a cowboy, you'd insert a chip into your mind and you could experience what it was like to be a cowboy in the 1800s in the wild west of the United States. I personally not want to go back in time and just have a mental stimulation. I can dream at night if I so choose. I'd always want to go there. Hopefully as a species, I think we would also want to always go there. Uh, 
underwater, again, I've talked about underwater, believe it or not, even though we've grown up on this planet, it remains one of those most challenging extreme environments for us in that we don't do very well in it. And it would be wonderful to find out that more of us could experience it, even if all we do is take a plunge underwater without any equipment. But I'm sure with the advanced robotics and technologies that are coming along, and potentially human editing so that we become more adapt at living in the marine environment, perhaps we can go further and, and explore more of our own planet just as much as we want to go off the planet. This is a quote by Michael Collins. He was the third astronaut involved in the, the Apollo 11 mission. He tends to get a bit neglected, but he had a unique perspective on humanity at that point because at one point when he's, or in a number of times actually, because the thing kept orbiting, he was the loneliest human in the solar system. And he said it's human nature to stretch, to go, to see, to understand. Exploration is not a choice really, it's an imperative. We all grow up as children being curious. I'm all for exploration where something that I send goes and determines that that place, that environment is safe for us to go. But I'm standing here today and hoping that in 2030, a number of you will also be getting ready to go wherever those robots have gone. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, look, we've heard three very different visions of what 2030 might be. Um, and actually, it's not that far away. If we think about it in terms of the number of years, we're, we're fast moving towards 2030. There's an interesting thing about technology, and that is that technology has been moving fast for a very long time. Uh, it's getting faster and faster. All the computers get more and more powerful. Moore's law applies. But whenever you have technology that affects a cultural change, it still takes a generation before it becomes mainstream. How are we going to take robots, artificial intelligence, which have already been around for a little while, and make use of those in an effective way that is culturally mainstream and acceptable? So what are some of the things that you've seen um, that would lead us to an artificially intelligent, robot-driven world um, that, uh, you know, what are some of the exciting things that are coming next? And, and when are we going to get there? Are we really going to get there by 2030? I think that's very interesting, um, Stuart. I hope so. I think, as I've mentioned, going to the bottom of the Marianas Trench is very difficult for humans. Um, robots and robotic rovers, for instance, being able to go to other planets, uh, that supplementary feeling that we're sending something that's almost humanoid in look, uh, you know, um, Bicentennial Man or um, Will Smith's film, that, that appeals to a degree because we might be able to mimic things that we want to then go and do. But it's that contradiction for me that if we completely rely on technology and we develop stuff in order to abdicate from doing it ourselves, we miss the very thing that it is to be human. All children grow up being curious. We tend to, by and large, lose that curiosity. And it would be wonderful to see that we could develop alongside the technology to go and preempt and prepare where we're going. But at the same time, I think part of the inherent appeal in exploration, anyway, is that inherent risk. And as a species, we're, we're pretty good normally at saying, I'll take a risk, and, and it would be wonderful to think that, that that, whatever developments there are, would continue. Andrew? If anyone's seen the mother of all demos back in the 1960s, when um, Engelbart demonstrated not just the computer mouse, but file hierarchical file systems, graphical user interfaces, linking technologies, and pretty much um, the protocols that were underwriting those, pretty much every foundational technology of modern computing. And then you have to say, well, how come it took that long to become the commonplace technologies that we have? And what was kind of interesting was people were grappling then about how is this going to be used? What's it going to be looking like? And you're talking about, well, we will use the computers to create shopping lists. But it wasn't yet happening in a, a really usable fashion. And it's it really leads to um, a saying, Roy Amara's law, is that we vastly overestimate the impact of technologies in the short term and vastly underestimate the impact in the longer term. So I think back in the 60s, you could see instances where something would be useful, but you couldn't really imagine the network effects of that turning into online retail, for example, or Amazon Prime and Amazon dash buttons. And I think one of the things that I tried to do with this scenario is say, it's going to be utilizing technologies that we already have. 
but it's going to be multiplying the impact and the effect. And we've had robots for, you know, 50 plus years, and it tends to be very unique, very specific industries, very little large social impact. And what we're talking about now is seeing the impact of robotics and AI and automation in our daily lives in the same way that smartphones have made a significant impact on our behavior patterns and just pushing it to those next kind of levels. Sure. Jack, what are your thoughts? Yeah, if, you, if you watch any uh, science fiction movie, it's always quite horrifying. It's all very negative. If you also watch a lot of media coverage around robotics or AI, it's always very negative. And I, firmly, I, I agree with you, it's not about the end stage. Let's get to step one and step two, and let's positively embrace technology um, and see what it's for you. If you're a nurse today, what will technology do to you? If you're a government official, what will it do to the labor market, to, to legal systems? And, and sometimes I see this almost uh, uh, neglecting that is going to happen or trying to prevent that it's going to happen. It's a bit like globalization. Eh? Someone says, let's uh, not do something about globalization. It's happening. So embrace it, be positive about it. Let's talk about the possibilities and also solving quite a few of our societal questions. Aging, I talked about healthcare. Robotics play a huge and very positive role there. And people, they get, actually many people, the vast majority will get more attractive jobs. Where most, if you would do a questionnaire tomorrow, would probably say, oh my God, it's threatening. My job is disappearing. Yeah, I don't think truck driving or driving is going to disappear as a job. Um, in the first instance, there are actually many, many vacant positions for driving. There and are. one of the yeah. reasons is because driving is a really horrible job with a high fatality rate. So when people say, oh my goodness, drivers are going to lose their jobs, they also don't look at what is it in the day of a life of a driver. Because a driver does many other tasks that aren't actually driving. So I look at that and I think it's more going to be that driving is going to become easier. And maybe you'll be able to sleep during the drive and focus on, uh, uh, how do you say? Harnessing, doing the maintenance, doing the other tasks that are at each of the stop stages yeah. of the journey. No, good point. So, so uh, absolutely, yeah. So job content will change. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's definitely the case. And there's going to be more services. So uh, if you choose a driver today to drive you around, it's not so much the fact that he drives you from A to B. It's also that he's there for you, that he improvises, uh, that he, uh, if you have a guest, that he's nice to be with. Huh? Mm. So that's very much the human aspect, which technology will not take over anytime soon. No, good yeah. point. Yeah. I think in yeah. so many ways, we're leading into a hybridized future where you know what we call human in the loop it's going to be autonomous driving that is perhaps remotely supervised or a person that's in the car that can switch in and out under certain circumstances. So we're going to come up with all of these funny hybrid models. It's really not going to be this, we no. flick the switch and suddenly it's autonomous driving. I mean, <laughs> people talk about that and they've been predicting it will happen 2015, 2018, 2020, 2024. Uh, but what's slowly happening is an incremental increase in the amount of autonomy that's occurring on the roads. Yeah. I mean, in each of your sessions, yes, you were talking about the future. Yes, you were talking about artificial intelligence and robots and everything that could come in 2030. But one of the things I noticed is that each of you were still talking about the human condition. Yeah. Um, AI has the ability to augment or replace. I personally feel that whether it augments or replaces is down to how autocratic the manager is who bought the or coded the AI because autocratic managers will want to reduce the costs and they want to replace rather than augment. Um, in terms of your feeling and, and just maybe give me and this wonderful audience 45 second sound bites. What do you think in terms of AI augmentation or replacement? Um, is it driven by autocratic managers or not? Um, what does the future really look like? Because a lot of people are worried about losing their jobs. A lot of people are worried about the gap between the haves and the have-nots becoming wider and wider and wider as AI applies. John. I don't know about anybody else, but I still actually enjoy driving. I don't enjoy it all the time. And a number of years ago in California, I didn't appreciate the distance between one location and another. And over the six-hour drive, nearly fell asleep a few times. So I could have done with a robotic driver then. 
Uh, weekends, being able to go out on a motorbike, I thoroughly enjoy. Can I see that interaction and that same self-satisfaction if I were to go and um, just have robotic staff and you know, lines of code? No, the human experience, I think, is what makes us and keeps us sane. We enjoy doing things. I don't want to delegate every part of my life. The main mundane stuff, the smartphone, great. I can get the weather. I don't need the weather station with me. I can get an Uber ride or I can call a friend. That's fantastic. Do I want to delegate all of my daily experiences to something else? Because I think then there's that risk that we will stop doing anything. And we're already part of that daytime television mentality where we sit and sort of veg out. And hopefully we can sort of get that balance right. 30 seconds, Andrew. I think you're wrong to say that AI is cheaper than humans. Uh, while we are more complex and more sophisticated and better at most things, we're also a heck of a lot cheaper than a complex system. I think the comparison that you made around the lines of code that are involved is really telling. And I think people are always saying, look, hardware's hard. That's why people don't want to invest in robotics. It's not about hardware. It's about complexity. You can build simple hardware, and it's cheap. You can build complex software, and it's expensive. So the sort of AI you're talking about, I think, would be very expensive and complex. And therefore, there would be no incentive to replace humans. There is a strong incentive to augment humans. Final word, Jack. Yeah. Do it in a tweet. Final word. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> the, the job that's definitely going to disappear are autocratic managers, because technology will give uh, people at the base of the organization all the information uh, they need to do their jobs well. What will happen in jobs is, and we talked about it in the driver, is the human part, which is not to be replaced, will be augmented within the job content. So again, the job content will change. A lot of median tasks, analytical tasks will disappear, and you will concentrate it on what you like best, connecting to patients, connecting to people you drive around, and that sort of thing. So again, there's a bright future for all of us. Fantastic. Uh, best news I've heard all day, autocratic managers will disappear by 2030. You heard it here first. Uh, please, everyone, give our wonderful people here a great round of applause. Thank you so much.